morning, American Reformed Church. We are uh, grieved as your pastors that we aren't able to be with you uh, in person, that we're not gathering as a faith community as we typically do due to um, a, a community spread um, of the coronavirus in central Iowa. And last night, Governor Reynolds uh, released a statement encouraging um, houses of worship and public gatherings um, to uh, perhaps cease meeting for a time. And so this is our best attempt uh, to provide um, a worship experience for you this morning, at least the sermon, at least listening together to God's word. Uh, I'm delighted that you're with us, and I'm also sad um, that we're not doing this in person this morning. We will do our best in the coming weeks as leaders, as consistory leaders, as staff leaders here at American Reformed Church to uh, carry on with the ministry to which God has called us. We believe that that's going to require some adaptive leadership on our part, and we're going to have to do some things differently uh, than what we might normally do, and uh, we trust that in the midst of that, God would be present to us as we seek to be agile and flexible um, and listening to the Spirit's voice. Join me in, uh, in prayer as we prepare to hear God's word this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come to you this morning eager to hear your word. As a community of faith gathered um, in different places this morning, not gathered together, but um, located in various uh, locations, we pray that your spirit would transcend the technology that indeed we would be able to hear a word from you, that you would speak truth into our lives, that you would speak hope into our lives, that you would speak your presence into our lives. God, we pray that these black and red letters on the white pages of our Bibles would leap off those pages, that they indeed would become a living word, that we might be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus our Savior and our Lord. It's in his, his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We're continuing our sermon series on the woes. Um, throughout this Lenten uh, series, we've been looking at Jesus' words to the disciples spoken about the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. We kicked off this sermon series uh, two weeks ago, and so we're in our third week in the woes, and our text for this morning is Matthew chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Listen for the word of the Lord. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice, mercy, and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is it just me, or sometimes does it seem like Jesus is the teacher who exaggerates all the time? When, sometimes when I hear Jesus' words in the Gospels, I think about this particular image, over-exaggeration, blowing things way out of proportion. We see this in our text this morning, don't we? You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This is what I like to call a hyperbolic metaphor. Breaking the words down, hyperbole, of course, is an exaggerated statement or a claim not meant to be taken literally. And a metaphor is a thing regarded as a representative or, or symbolic of something else, especially something abstract. Jesus uses a hyperbolic metaphor. He speaks in exaggerated terms, way over the top terms, to help us come to grips with something, to wake us up, to get our attention, to prompt us to listen well to what he's saying. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, and you swallow a camel. 
Jesus, of course, is teaching on three particular things. First, he's teaching on herbal tithing. Second, he's teaching on weightier matters of the faith. And third, he's teaching on practicing these without disregarding those. First, herbal tithing. Did you notice in our text that Jesus wants his disciples to pay attention to something that he notices the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day doing? That is this. They are tithing the mint and the dill and the cumin that they're growing as herbs in their gardens and they are neglecting the other weightier matters of the law. They're tithing these herbs. And you might say, well, well why are the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day tithing, giving a tenth of, of, their, of their herbs in their gardens? Where do we find that in the Old Testament? Well, actually, we find it in a couple of different places. First, in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, uh, the Lord says, all tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or, or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, we read, Set apart a tithe of all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field. In the presence of the Lord your God, in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the firstlings of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Set apart a tithe of all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field. Of course, the truth of the matter is, is that there's nothing in the Torah about tithing in particular on one's herbs in one's gardens. There's nothing in sacred scripture that indicates that, that they were to tie their mint and their dill and their cumin. And yet, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, so hyper-focused with a, a laser-like focus on wanting to make sure that they followed every jot and tittle of the law, have fixed their attention on every little thing to make sure that they are within God's good graces by following this law. And so they begin to tithe on all these sorts of things. They tithe on their, their dill and their mint and their cumin, these herbs that have grown in their gardens. And this is a problem for Jesus because in their hyper-focus on their herbs, they have neglected to see the larger expansiveness of the kingdom that Jesus uh, comes to inaugurate. They have forgotten the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faith. You have neglected the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faith, Jesus says, I think it would be helpful for us to break down these three words because there are multiple connotations and multiple meanings that can be made of these words. Justice is that Greek word chrysin, coming from the Greek word chrysis, the administration of what is right and fair, right in the sense of justice and or righteousness, justice. Jesus takes note of the way that the religious leaders have forgot to set their lives in right relationship right relationship with one another and right relationship in their relationship with God. They have forgotten that this, this practice, this, this, this centrifugal practice of justice in their very lives. They have abandoned this. But it's not just justice, it's also mercy, elias. The kindness or the concern expressed for someone in need, mercy, compassion, pity, clemency, and all their focus and, and their laser-like focus to make sure that they're divvying up all their garden herbs, they have forgotten the greater purposes of God to, to be a people of compassion, to be a people of mercy, to be a people of pity who, whose eyes are open to those in our world who are on the outskirts those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed, the poor, the orphan, and the widow. Justice, mercy, and faith. Piston is the Greek word. That which evokes trust and faith. A state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed. Faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, commitment. The religious leaders have abandoned this call. They are not those in whom others can place their trust. They are unreliable. This makes me think of one of the concepts that, 
that our Ritter Church's Learning Change team has been learning over the course of the past five years, something called integrity. Integrity is doing what you say you will do when you say you are going to do it in the manner that it's intended to be done. Integrity, similar to this Greek concept of pistis, of faith. It is acting in a trustworthy manner, and the religious leaders in Jesus' day have neglected this practice. But I find it so interesting that justice, mercy, and faith aren't simply meant to be nouns in Jesus' words to the disciples. Rather, Jesus, Jesus wants these words, although they are nouns, to be springboards into action. Justice, mercy, and faith are not concepts simply to be understood. They're not transactional realities by which we enter into the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. No, these are not just concepts to be experienced or concepts that we receive. No, these are the very practices that Jesus calls us to live our lives by. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You ought to have practice you have to enact you you have to act with justice you have to act with mercy you have to act with faith in other words to be a disciple to be a follower of jesus is to lay our lives down for the very good of others in our world it is to ensure that people are treated with kindness with fairness with trustworthiness and this, of course, is what leads Jesus to call the religious leaders blind guides. They have no idea where they're going because their focus is so vigilant on divvying up and dividing up their herbs from their gardens and making sure that they follow every jot and tittle of the law they have forgotten to see the larger purposes by which God calls them to live. In all their efforts to uphold the law, they have venerated the law. They have made the law their priority and they have forgotten the one who is the great lawgiver. They have forgotten the one who is the great lawgiver being God, a God who gives the law so that we might love well. This is one of the great hallmarks of the Reformed tradition. John Calvin said that the that the, the law is given to us to, of course, teach us of our sin, to convict us of our unrighteousness. But Calvin talked about the third use of the law, that the primary use of the law is given after, after the Israelites have exited uh, Egypt. The law is given to them after they have experienced the exodus, after they have experienced salvation, that the law is given to us as a, as a guideline, as a way for us to live gratefully to live in love for God and for our neighbor. The law is a gift meant to help us to live more holistically in light of God's kingdom. And because the religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't understand this, they have become like blind guides. They are straining out gnats and swallowing camels. And by the way, the metaphor would have been shocking and surprising to Jesus' first listeners because both gnats and camels were animals deemed unclean in the Hebrew tradition. It does make me wonder, in light of the global pandemic in which we find ourselves, the coronavirus, COVID-19, it does make me wonder, given this word from the Lord, how is it that Jesus is calling us to practice justice, mercy, and faith in the midst of a global pandemic. You've probably seen the stories. I've seen them too. They're a bit uh, terrifying, to be honest. It's terrible how humanity can quickly devolve into the lowest common denominator behaviors of our society. We've seen the images of people going to places like Costco and Walmart and even Fairway, I understand, here in Orange City, Don's Food Center, and stocking up on toilet paper and water. In fact, stockpiles of toilet paper and water. They must be stockpiling it in their basements. I don't know what they do with all of these things. I've seen images of people actually physically having altercations in stores because they are so concerned, so nervous, so fearful that they won't have enough 
toilet paper. Interesting. I wonder what it looks like to be a just person. I wonder what it looks like to make sure that everyone is treated with fairness. I wonder what it looks like to make sure that we're not just hoarding for ourselves, but that we're taking only what we need so that our neighbors might also receive what they need. I love the story that became a Twitter uh, sensation this past week. This is by a runner in Bend, Oregon, uh, named Rebecca Mera. Uh, she says, I went to the grocery store this afternoon, and as I was walking in, I heard a woman yell to me from her car. I walked over and found an elderly woman and her husband. She cracked the window open a bit more and explained to me nearly in tears that they are afraid to go into the store, afraid to get sick as they are in their 80s, and hear that the novel coronavirus is affecting older people disproportionately and that they don't have family around to help them out. And through the crack in the window, she handed me a $100 bill and a grocery list and asked if I would be willing to buy her groceries. I bought the groceries and placed them in her trunk and gave her back the change. She told me she had been sitting in the car for nearly 45 minutes before I had arrived waiting to ask the right person for help. I know it's a time of hysteria and nerves, but offer help to anyone you can. Not everyone has people to turn to. It seems to me that Rebecca Mara understands what it looks like to practice justice, mercy, and faith. The challenge is before us, dear friends of American Reformed Church. This morning we are not able to gather in public worship. And that grieves your pastors deeply. We love you. We love being in connection with you. We love being in relationship with you. And we know that many of you love being in relationship with each other. Indeed, that's what makes this community so special. And yet even in the midst of an pandemic like the one in which we find ourselves, we are still called to find ways to provide touch. Maybe not physically, but certainly emotionally. There are things that we can do, like pick up the telephone and call. A person that sits down the pew from you that you don't really know very well, a person's a different age demographic, they probably have different life interests, but maybe you could give that person a call today and say, hey, I missed seeing you this morning in worship. Or maybe, maybe you'll actually do that very old-fashioned thing and you'll get out a pen and some paper, maybe a note card, and write a note to somebody in our congregation who's struggling with a health crisis or struggling with the loss of a loved one. Maybe you could write a note the good old-fashioned way and actually send it in the U.S. mail. Can you believe it? Would it be great if there was a run on postage stamps at the Orange City Post Office because all these folks from American Church were, were sending notes to one another? There are ways that we can practice justice and mercy and faith. Ultimately, we are going to have to find ways to be the church without large public worship gatherings. And one of the things that Pastor Elizabeth and I are beginning to pray about is what it might look like for us to have smaller gatherings located geographically by neighborhoods where people who are healthy and who are feeling well can gather together to pray, to share the burdens of the world, to listen to some scripture together, and to perhaps hear a word from the Lord together. What might it look like, given this crisis before us, given this pandemic before us, what might it look like if in the 21st century we might indeed become more like the first century church? Indeed, I think the options and possibilities before us are endless. I want to close with the flu pandemic of 1918. We are such an awe historical people, meaning that we oftentimes in our own culture don't appreciate history, or we don't have any knowledge of history. Just yesterday, I was watching a, a show I had recorded a few weeks back called CBS Sunday Morning, uh, in which they were talking about those who were aware of the Holocaust. 
Did you know that something like 47% of Americans, only 47% only 47 of Americans are actually aware, have any knowledge that the Holocaust ever happened? Half of us don't even know about this. It's a side note. This morning, I want us to think a little bit about the flu pandemic of 1918. Do you know about this? It affected 500 million people around the world from 1918 to 1920. Roughly 25% of the population was diagnosed with this or struggled with the effects of the Spanish flu. The death toll was between 17 and 50 million people, some say as high as 100 million, and 500,000 to 675,000 in the U.S. alone passed away, died uh, from the Spanish flu. Chris Gers, who serves as professor of history at Bethel University in the Twin Cities, uh, wrote an article on, um, on Pathios this past week entitled, What the 1918 Influenza Pandemic Meant for American Christians. I found this fascinating. He reviewed the encyclopedia of articles written in American newspapers from late September through early November of 1918. This was the first peak in the spread of the disease when cities around the U.S. banned worship services, sounds familiar, and other public gatherings. Listen to what he found. First of all, from a newspaper on Saturday, October 26, 1918, from, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Herald, the Grand Rapids Herald, doubted that anyone has suffered more from the state ban on public worship than the members of the city's 17 Christian Reformed churches who, quote, have been trained from childhood to regard regular church attendance as natural in their lives as eating breakfast. I love that. Families are trying to fill the gap with private worship, but Reformed leaders are upset that churches are closed while schools remain open. It would seem that if there were danger of contagion anywhere, it would be among the physically undeveloped youngsters congregating in the schoolrooms day by day. Apparently, Reformed folks weren't so pleased that they had to shutter their worship services. But then there's some really wonderful examples. First, from Friday, October 18, 1918, from the Daily Telegram in Worcester, Massachusetts. The Daily Telegram shared examples of how Christians were responding to influenza even as public worship ceased. Women, women from three local churches were taking care of epidemic orphans, giving them not only food and clothing, but supplying them with plenty of healthful recreation and a little systemized instruction too. And a Catholic women's club brought clothing and food to influenza patients, including 28 jars of applesauce, 28 quarts of lamb stew, and 35 squares of Johnny cake. Saturday, November 2, 1918, St. Louis, Missouri. Samuel Thurman, rabbi of the first synagogue established west of the Mississippi, affirmed the closure decision by the chief of the health board. He wrote, due to, to his determined action, St. Louis has been spared the terrible fate of other cities of its size and larger. The price we are paying now is commensurately small compared with the gain and good we shall obtain in the end. Let us be patient. Let us hope and pray for a speedy banishment of the dread monster disease from our midst and a happy return to the healthy and normal life of the community. But my most favorite, my most treasured that moved me to the core was from the words of an old Methodist revivalist preacher named George R. Stewart in Birmingham, Alabama, Monday, October 14, 1918. Listen. We have had the strange experience of a churchless Sabbath, wrote the Methodist revivalist George R. Stewart in the Age Herald. What has it taught us? Most importantly, the pandemic should convince intelligent Christians to trust science rather than seeking to tempt God to perform a miracle in the preservation of our health. Christians do not discount their faith in the omnipotence of their God by keeping their bodies and homes and streets clean and non-germ producing, by using care and traffic and travel, accepting vac vaccination, sprays and disinfectants, and keeping God's own laws of health and life. 
Any other course is the fruit of ignorance and false teaching. Most importantly, the pandemic should convince intelligent Christians to trust science rather than seeking to tempt God to perform a miracle in the preservation of our health. Indeed, what does it look like to be a people of justice and mercy and faith? It looks like for us to be a people who trust who trust those with the expertise among us, and even more so, who trust a God who promises to go with us always, even to the close of the age. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. This morning's prayers are taken from the Lutheran World Federation. I will say, hear our cry, O God, and I'd invite those of you who are watching or listening this morning to respond with the phrase listen to our prayer again i will say hear our cry O god and you respond with listen to our prayer let us pray O god our healer show your compassion for the whole human family that is in turmoil and burdened with illness and with fear hear our cry O god listen to our prayer Come to our aid as the coronavirus spreads globally. Heal those who are sick. Support and protect their families and friends from being infected. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Grant us your spirit of love and self-discipline so that we may come together working to control and eliminate the coronavirus. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Make us vigilant, attentive, and proactive in the eradication of all diseases, malaria, dengue, HIV and AIDS, and others that create suffering and often result in death for many people. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Heal our self-centeredness and indifference that makes us worry only when the virus threatens us. Open ways beyond timidity and fear that too easily ignore our neighbor. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Strengthen and encourage those in public health services and in the medical profession, caregivers, nurses, attendants, doctors, all who commit themselves to caring for the sick and their families. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Inspire, give insight and hope to all researchers focused on developing a vaccine. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Sustain all workers and business owners who suffer loss of livelihood due to shutdowns, quarantines, closed borders, and other restrictions. Protect and guard all those who must travel. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Guide the leaders of the nations that they speak the truth halt the spread of misinformation and act with justice so that all your family may know healing. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Heal our world. Heal our bodies. Strengthen our hearts and our minds and in the midst of turmoil, give us hope and peace. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Hold in your gentle embrace all who have died and who will die this day. Comfort their loved ones in their despair. Hear our cry, O God. Listen to our prayer. Remember all your family, the entire human race, and all your creation in your love, especially Maribel Allen, Joanna Altona, Kathy Cry, Jen Lambert, Carrie Neuenheis, Natalie Sampson, Ray Schramm, and Susan West. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends of American Reformed Church, may you go forth to be a people of justice, of mercy, of faith. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.